Kia ora koutou katoa ko Cressida Toku Ingoa. Um, I de am delighted to introduce Dr Patrice Jones, who will be giving today's Val Plumwood Memorial Lecture. Uh, so I'm just going to speak uh, for a moment about Val Plumwood, um, and then I'll introduce Patrice. So Val Plumwood was an Australian environmental philosopher and intersectional feminist whose 1992 book Feminism and the Mastery of Nature is considered a classic. In the 70s, Plumwood was involved in a radical critique of the traditional Western concept of nature in which only human beings mattered and nature was not morally significant. She saw that anthropocentrism as a value system rests on the assumption that there is a deep division between humanity and nature and that this kind of binary enabled the oppression of many groups. We are so lucky to have Patrice Jones join us today and it falls to me to the, do the introduction. This is a somewhat daunting task as Patrice's career is multifaceted, vibrant and significant. Patrice is simultaneously a scholar, an activist, and an animal rescuer, having co-founded a sanctuary which homes some of the most oppressed and vulnerable non-human animals in the United States. Patrice has written two books, Aftershock, Confronting Trauma in a Violent World, A Guide for Activists and Their Allies, published in 2007, and The Oxen at the Intersection, A Collision, published in 2014 as well as a number of published academic articles and chapters in some of the most influential critical animal studies and ecofeminist texts. When reading Patrice's writing, it is clear that Patrice's devotion to activism and animal rescue are inextricably woven into the scholarship. When this is coupled with real life experiences, for instance, the rehabilitation of ex-cockfighting roosters at Vine Sanctuary, the complexities of oppression and possibilities for liberation become somewhat clearer. Vine Sanctuary was named for the acronym, Vegan is the Next Evolution, but also for how vines represent interconnectedness. Vines also remind me of pathways. I think it can be difficult to see where your academic journey will take you if you don't have a framework or influences to follow. Luckily for me, and for everyone committed to an intersectional understanding of oppression, which includes non-human animals, we are able to see a trajectory marked for us by people like Patrice Jones. Please well, join me in welcoming Patrice. Tanei katoi, tanei katoi, tanei katoi katoa. And I wish I could also greet you as you would be greeted if you came to the sanctuary, um, perhaps by a group of several self-possessed ducks who would look at you, talk to themselves about you, look at you again a little more closely, share with each other, but not with you, some concluding remarks, <laughs> and then go about their day. Because if you were to have that experience, then that would be simultaneously including you in the uh, world of other than human animals and raising the question, who exactly are you? And more importantly to them, I think, what? are you going to do? I want to thank um, ASA and the New Zealand Center for Human Animal Studies and Annie and everyone um, for inviting me here. I'm not really able to uh, summon up enough words to express my gratitude for that, um, as well as the degree to which I'm daunted by the um, task before me in terms of giving the Val Plumwood Memorial Lecture. I also want to give a shout out uh, to two parrots, uh, Wiley the African Grey and Harvey the Amazonian, whose often surreal interjections from a further room helped to loosen my own associations as I was working on um, figuring out how to talk about how to um, let birds flutter in our brains. Um, Harvey and Wiley live at Vine Sanctuary, 
which by the way also stands for veganism is not enough. Um, uh, Vine is an LGBTQ-led farmed animal refuge which does work from an intersectional understanding of um, the, uh, uh, an eco-feminist understanding of the intersection of oppressions. So we work for um, social and environmental justice as well as for animal liberation. More than 600 animals live at the sanctuary uh, ranging from 3,000 pound Scotty who is the uh, elder of the special needs herd to a little parakeet called Sunbeam uh, who's a friend of Harvey's and Wiley's. We're situated on um, more than 40 hectares um, uh, in uh, Vermont, which is in the northeastern United States, and which is a region dominated by dairying. Um, sanctuary residents include survivors of dairying as well as survivors of cockfighting and um, other uses of animals in entertainment um, and every form of animal agriculture uh, that you can imagine. So cows and ducks and geese and chickens, so many chickens and pigeons and alpacas, sheep, goats, emus, <laughs> guinea fowl, so many birds and people I've forgotten I'm sure because I'm a little nervous. We began as a small refuge for chickens surrounded by factory farms in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States um, uh, in, in Maryland uh, in the place where factory farming was invented and perfected. And there we were a sanctuary for chickens um, uh, surrounded by factory farms. Then, as now, we tried to give our um, chicken community members as close as possible to the life led by their um, wild kin, the jungle fowl of South Asia. Uh, and what that meant, and still means, is um, getting up at sunrise every morning. Um, to open the coops, which is um, not easy for me because I'm a night owl. Um, so one morning I got up and um, staggered out into the chicken yard um, and then stopped. Stuck still as I seriously considered the possibility that I was experiencing my first encounter with an extraterrestrial being. There in the yard was someone who seemed as though they had been made by surrealists playing the exquisite corpse game. Um, there was a long beak and a little head and a tubby body and none of the parts seemed to match each other. And then as I stood there, this being levitated straight up, <laughs> making the sound <laughs> which I hope for you is echoing the moths, and then disappeared into the woods. Scratched my head, went about my day went back inside and considered the possibility that this might have been a bird. <sighs> Looked it up and found that what I had seen, who I had seen, was a, 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 an American woodcock. Um, American woodcocks, as it happens, look very much like kiwis. Long beak, tubby body. And um, like kiwis, tend to confound our categories. Uh, uh, you all probably know that kiwis are considered by scientists to be the most aberrant of the already odd category of um, flightless birds. Um, uh, woodcocks are shorebirds of the forest, combining the long beak of somebody like a sandpiper with the mottled plumage of a shy forest resident. Um, they gather together in singing grounds where the males will often do that um, vertical takeoff and that sound is not birdsong but the uh, wind uh, in the feathers. 
Now this might not seem like much of a story. Um, Patrice saw a bird um, <laughs> who happened to look a bit like a kiwi um, <laughs> and turned out to have some interesting um, characteristics. Um, but at the moment I saw that bird, I was sincerely ready to believe that reality was very different than I had previously believed. Um, some combination of being near the dream state and the surprise of seeing this marvelous being sort of flew open the door. And when I say I was seriously considered the possibility that I was seeing someone from another planet, I mean that. I was ready to imagine that everything I thought I knew was not true and that things I had never imagined might be true. Um, and that state... That state, that disorientation, that dépaisement, that willingness to consider that everything you thought was true is a little bit askew of what you thought and things you didn't even imagine are true. That's the state that we will need to induce in others, but also be willing to enter into ourselves, huh? Um, and so, um, if we want to do what Val Plumwood called a thorough rethink of uh, the logic of domination, the centrist logics of anthropocentrism, Eurocentrism, androcentrism, all of them rooted in rationalism, Which brings me, ha, here I have Plumwood problem via P-Funk. Um, so yes, that brings me to what I call the Plumwood problem uh, by way of the Afrofuturist funk rock ensemble that's sometimes recorded as Parliament, sometimes as Funkadelic, and are collectively known as P-Funk. Um, when I was in graduate school, um, there was a, uh, on the way to school from my apartment was a um, uh, graffiti that reproduced uh, one of their album covers, uh, Free Your Mind, Your Ass Will Follow. Hmm? And I walked past that every day um, um, on my way to very serious studies in clinical psychology. Um, and wondered because I, my favorite funkadelic song tells us to quote dance our way out of our constrictions which would suggest that you free your ass and your mind will follow <laughs> um, and so I would go to grad school every day pondering the mind ass problem um, <laughs> which is probably why I would do things like write my papers as dialogues between Psyche Logos and Mojo. Um, which, by the way, just shout out if I don't get to it, graffiti was and remains, provided that it is surprise, uh, sufficiently surprising, colorful, and thought-provoking rather than didactic, a way to surprise people into thinking things that they might not have thought otherwise. Um, So Plumwood was a philosopher, a professional thinker um, who questioned um, rationality, critiqued rationality, um, insisted that we would need to rethink rationality, but um, uh, maybe didn't go far enough in questioning whether thinking is the tool we'll need to undermine the hegemony of thinking. Um, she did ask, can we think differently? And I think by that she didn't just mean have different ideas, but actually think in different ways. 
I would go so far as to say use different neural pathways than we are currently using. Um, she did ask that and leave it as a question. And I think that we can. I know that other animals do think differently uh, than we do. Uh, some people do think differently uh, than is uh, the norm um, or is the... Uh, I'm one of them, I think. Um, but I think that it's more than a matter of deciding that we disagree with certain foundational principles of um, the dominant culture. Um, and, 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 and I think when it comes to rationality, it's more than simply disagreeing um, with the elevation of rationality um, above all else or the uh, soul um, attributing uh, rationality solely to people. I think, I think, I think to undermine rationalism, we're, we're, we're going to need uh, to go a, a good bit further than that. And, and to do that, to explain why, I'm going to take a little detour, okay, about... Um, rationality. Are you okay with me so far? Okay, you're in the dark a little bit, so I can't really see. Um, all right, so let's imagine, um, let's imagine, oh, so first, first of all, just as a, a reminder, the brain, um, quiet as it's kept, is uh, part of the body. Um, and um, and uh, there's actually not a like a firm, clear distinction between like brain and the rest of the nervous system. Like there's these tendrils that go all through, right? Nerves. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so 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 let us think about all the things that your nervous system does. Hmm? Okay, let us think about all of the kinds of cognition um, that your nervous system does, and let's imagine them as like. Um, like a, a, let's imagine them as like a big uh, circle, or if you'd like to go 3D, you can make it a sphere. It's fine with me. Um, and so this is all of it, all of the things that your brain is doing all the time. Hmm? And then um, uh, this little piece here, um, which we're not going to put in the center, so we'll put it like down into the left a bit. Um, that's what you're conscious of you can hold in your conscious mind um, seven plus or minus two things at any given time. Um, in your working memory, we can chunk things together to make it feel like more than seven. Um, but beyond that, we start to not be able to hold it in our brains, and that's why we have to do things like, you know, start drawing or mapping or whatever it might be to hold things in my, or math, math equations to yeah um, okay so 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 there's this little bit that's that's that what that's what you're conscious of right now right and then of course then there uh, let's let's uh, this piece maybe blue maybe that okay uh, that's the things that could be conscious right that, that, that they're not what you're thinking of right now but you could uh, they're, 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 con they're mental processes um, that could become conscious to you right so if you are um, I don't know, if, if like me uh, uh, here, uh, you, you took a walk, um, you know, through an a unfamiliar city and then um, you turn around and, you're, and your feet are just taking you back um, the way that you went and your body is doing one of the kinds of thinking, um, navigating, um, and your body is navigating um, and you're not thinking about it, but then you stop and you say, wait, where am I? Am I going the right way? Suddenly you can become conscious, right, of that navigational process. So that's what I'm talking about, the things that could become conscious. Your brain is doing a lot of thinking, though, that, 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 that you would not be able to think about. So if, you're, if we're still walking down the street and you are, um, hmm, huh, you're walking along the sidewalk and um, this way, and then you see uh, your friend uh, who you want to meet, or maybe the, uh -huh, your enemy who you would like to avoid. No, let's say your friend who you would like to meet. It's Fiona. Um, and, 
And so you're going to see Fiona, and you want to say hi to Fiona, right? But Fiona's sort of hurrying along, and you've been sort of ambling along. And so you can, without doing any kind of calculation at all, you can time it so that you'll hit the corner at the same time as Fiona did, right? Um, and, and you'll keep your eye on her, and you'll be walking, and, you're, and the whole time, your brain will be doing quite complex physics that unless you're a, 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 a math, very few people would be able to do even sitting down and calculating it out slowly, consciously, um, and, 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 and you're really only the most extremely gifted would be able to sort of do that in their conscious brain, do that kind of physics. I think your brain is doing it all the time, right? So, um, what I'm reminding you of is that um, not only is um, uh, your, um, let's call it your sir conscious uh, self, um, bigger uh, than your conscious self. Your sir conscious self is, is way smarter um, than your conscious self. Um, and doing a lot of, 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 of quite complicated um, things. Uh, um, and yet, We've been schooled to think of this, not only as like, or maybe this, not only as the uh, center of ourselves, um, uh, uh, and not only as the, like, the smartest when it's not, um, and not only as the be all and end all when in fact it's very limited, um, but as the seat of our very selves. People will learn, for example, that, um, so, so some studies will show that, you know, when you, uh, if you're asked to, to choose, like, which of these is your favorite color, uh, your, your, your brain will have made that choice before you're conscious of that choice, right? And some people, they'll react to that finding by saying, oh, my God, that means um, I don't have free will. As though someone other than I was doing that choosing. Like, like if it's not conscious, it's not me? Do you, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So, 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 um, okay. So, so one piece of the problem with sort of elevating conscious rationality is, you know, how much bigger uh, our own ability to think is than that sort of narrow uh, slice of reasoning. Because, um, and it's not only conscious thought, because, um, Please forgive me. I'm trying to use words linearly to talk to you about how words linearly is not sufficient. Um, and whoo, I've had a hard time organizing this. Um, so, 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 I think that, so there's, so there's non-conscious reasoning and there's conscious reasoning. Um, but, but, but when we talk about rationality, like that's not all of reasoning. There's all kinds of reasoning that aren't rationality. When I think of rationality, I think of ratio. I think of uh, weighing things up and measuring them against each other. And that's really the root of rationalism. Oh, did you hear that pun with ratio and root? Um, and... Um, but there's other kinds of reasoning, right? There's spatial reasoning, there's um, visual reasoning, there's navigational reasoning, there's maths of, 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 of non-algebraic sorts. Um, and, 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 and so it's really quite striking to me that what we're, we're, when we elevate rationality as like the, not just the sine qua non of your identity, but like the defining feature of humans, you know, we're talking about this really tiny sliver of what is itself a very small portion of your, um, uh, of the capabilities of your brain and the rest of your nervous system, huh? Um, so I think that's folly, as did Plumwood. Um, 
and I think it leads us into error in many different ways. So not only uh, does the elevation of rationality uh, 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 or de the definition of, of human beings by way of rationality, um, it confuses us about ourselves. Um, it leads us to overestimate the degree to which rational thought drives human behavior. It leads us to underestimate the ways that we fall into error when we think we're being logical. Um, it causes us to overestimate the ways that logic drives the behavior of other people and to treat them as though they are thinking machines as opposed to really complicated animals um, with feelings and thoughts um, that are, are not simply confined to that, yeah? Um, and not only all of that, but I think that it also leads us this is, uh, to, it leads to a sort of atrophy of our ability to engage in other kinds of thinking, other kinds of reasoning. I think our capabilities for visual thinking, for example, tend to be really stunted. Um, does that make sense? Um, uh, but I think that the, 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 the possibility of those pathways being activated is still there. This may sound like a strange analogy, but when I was putting on my socks yesterday, I was thinking about how... Um, you know, so many people who, for whatever reason, are not able to use their hands have developed the ability to do all sorts of things, right? With their, with their finger, with their toes, yeah? Um, and so, really, it's safe to presume that for all of us, the neural pathways that could be activated to allow us to develop um, the ability to do that are, are there. They're just not being used right now, right? And so what I'm arguing here is that there's this wealth of, um, of, of cognitive um, and emotional capabilities uh, that we have that at present are atrophied um, due to the dominion of um, rationality. Hmm? And that I think that's something we're going to need to undo uh, if we want to truly undermine these centric logics that are founded um, in rationality. Hmm? Um, as a side note, since I called the talk Birds Beyond Words, we have a similar problem with words, right? Um, so, uh, uh, words are, the sound symbols that we call words are just one of many different uh, ways that we can communicate, hmm? uh, right? There's pheromones and there's gestures, which I'm very big on, um, and um, um, sounds that aren't words, and uh, probably ways that we don't even know um, about consciously. Uh, and yet, um, uh, those also are sort of shunted aside in favor of words. Words are also all bound up with rationality because they become um, the building blocks of thought for us, right? So you may not realize this, but so when you were an infant, when you looked at color, you processed the color in this hemisphere, huh? Um, uh, but then when you learned words, um, you started um, processing uh, them here. So uh, the color is shunting through Broca's area, the language area. And, 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 and if you think that doesn't matter to anything, I will tell you there, are, there is research that shows that people who are speakers of different languages have differing color abilities. So speakers of uh, Russian, for example, are able to detect more shades of blue uh, than speakers of English. Um, well, then there's no way around. You've learned language if you're here, and so there's really no way around um, your brain um, shunting all of your perceptions um, through Broca's area now. Um, but nonetheless, I do think um, that we could do more uh, to um, allow ourselves to uh, think without words Right, as we do when we're, um, anybody who does like, oh, well, we have a sculptor in the audience, but um, we also, people who like build things, right? Um, or even people who are like really good at packing cars for trips, right? Like there's this zone you go into, you're not thinking, right? You're, you're, space, you're thinking with your hands, right? 
Um, you're not thinking with words. You're not thinking this one will go here and that one, right? Yeah. So I think that those capabilities as well uh, tend to tend to tend to um, um, have have tended to fall off for us because of the uh, dominance of words, which is why one of my my focus here is on ways beyond words that we can work, but I, I certainly don't, as someone who's standing here using words to talk to you, I'm obviously not saying that um, words don't have a role in this. And um, uh, Plumwood, in fact, talked about poetry as uh, one possibility, um, one possible praxis uh, for helping us think differently, and poetry does have that way of breaking and putting words back together again, and I absolutely agree with that, even though I'm going to focus on some of the non-word uh, things going forward. So, um, well, I'm talking really fast because I wrote a two-hour talk, um, and <laughs> we're still going to get through it in one hour. Um, so, 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 so I think we need, uh, it's not so much new neural, yeah, new neural pathways. We need to stimulate, um, uh, uh, activate uh, uh, po potential uh, neural, pa neural pathways that, that, that we're not presently using. I mean, literally think differently. I, I, I mean this very seriously. We need to literally think differently. And I think that if we, the degree to which we expand our ability to do that, to think visually, to think spatially, to think without words, uh, to communicate without words, um, that will help us to solve this crisis of imagination um, that we're in the midst of and which is uh, prohibiting us um, really making any sort of mm, dent in the climate crisis. Um, and uh, I think also will help us to think um, ecologically you know, which is a complicated way to think. It's a systems way of thinking, and it's, um, um, uh, it's easier to do um, visually and spatially uh, sometimes uh, than it is to try and um, uh, talk about um, uh, systems linearly. Uh-huh. So far, so good? Yeah, okay, so we need new neural pathways, for heaven's sake. Okay, so here I have daunting. Um, and at this point, I think I jumped up and ran to the window and said, I can't do this. Um, <laughs> but luckily, we don't have to start from scratch with this because for at least the last hundred years, uh, there have been folks um, who have been within Western culture um, and outside, um, or within, within Europe and in places colonized by Europe, thinking and mm, acting uh, and doing, I should say thinking and doing um, things um, with the hope of doing what I just said we need to do. Um, and so I'd like to look a little bit as quickly as I can. We're going to take a really quick spin through art history. And oh, I'm a little scared because there are actual artists in the audience. Um, so let me give you a quote. L quote, logic is a complication. Logic is always false. It draws the superficial threads of concepts and words towards illusory concepts and centers. Val Plumwood on the role of rationality in similarly structured centrisms? No. Tristan Sarza in 1918 in the howl of outrage known as the Dada Manifesto. <sighs> Mechanized the mechanized killing, which is the apex of rationalism, led to 40 million people being killed or injured in four short years during World War I. And, you know, those of us who have only read about it in history books, which is all of us, almost, maybe can't imagine uh, the um, shock of the poison gas coming from machines in the sky. And 
And so, in the wake of this carnage came this, um, it gets called an arts movement, but it was about, yes, it was artists and poets, but it was about um, uh, social change. It was about using any means necessary to expose the nonsense um, that was the rationality that led to that kind of killing, right? And so the Dadaists, um, uh, they, they staged what would now be called happenings in which they spouted nonsense poetry. That's where the word Dada comes. Dada, Dada, Dada. It makes no sense. There's no sense here. Um, uh, they did, they, what we've now uh, denatured forms of appear in galleries as installation art. They, they, they used found materials to create things that they hoped would unsettle people. Um, they also did activist things like plastering posters on shop windows, um, denouncing capitalism, denouncing the war machine, denouncing all of it. Um, and, um, you know, it might, it's easy, it's easy, it's easy when you look back, you know, to think, oh, it's quaint because, you know, some of the things that they were doing were shocking then, but, you know, are not at all shocking now. Um, uh, uh, but they were deadly serious. They were deadly serious. Um, and, um, We can't say that they um, succeeded. Um, my personal take is that um, Dada expressed the nonsense um, quite well and the anguish very well um, uh, and did so to people who were really looking for some sucre. Um, and, um, and, 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 um, and so some people vibrated because they were saying, look, we're all damaged, we're all broken here. Um, and some people then flocked to that, yes, we're all damaged, we're all broken, but others are like, oh, I think I'm going to retreat to where it feels safer. Um, and so there was a lot of, um, of, of expressing the, uh, the critique, uh, but not uh, imagining a different world in a way that would, um, yeah, nonetheless, they started something, right? The Dada Manifesto made its way uh, to Brazil uh, where it um, 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 uh, helped uh, to uh, uh, spark the Antropofagio um, Manifesto, which then itself, decades later, was taken up by the uh, Tropicalistas who uh, used music and art against military dictatorship um, and, and, and were well aware of the echoes of Dada. Um, and of course then um, came uh, 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 the various uh, surrealisms um, and, and please, I've, I've circled that S many, the last S many times, surrealisms. Um, another, oh, thing, another cultural phenomena that gets, uh, I think, minimized as an art movement when people were really thinking about, uh, who, who were, were using art um, to do things. Um, uh, and we're certainly doing art, but doing um, more than art. Um, sir, art? I don't know. Um, so, oh, how much, where am I? <laughs> New Zealand, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so surrealism. Uh, for those who don't know, um, it signifies more reality, right? People sometimes use this as like unreal. They'll say surreal when they mean unreal or weird or something, but surrealism means more reality, more reality than our narrow logics allow us. And in, if you have any doubt that they were about the same thing that Val Plumwood was about, uh, I'm, I've got a few more quotes. So here's a, oh, and, 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 and I said surrealisms because uh, surrealism existed not just in Europe, but in the Caribbean, um, in the African diaspora. Um, uh, uh, it was uh, the only uh, sort of European started art in which uh, women and people of color participated uh, centrally from the beginning. Um, and um, 
Uh, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But let me give you this quote from uh, René Menel, who in 1945 was a Caribbean surrealist. Um, quote, Aristotle's logic, a practice of things or corpses. Thought is biological, or it does not exist, unquote. And then uh, Suzanne Cécile, uh, uh, who uh, along with her partner Amy, uh, uh, was not only an important surrealist, but uh, a deeply important um, 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 uh, 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 decolonial uh, theorist. Um, so in the Caribbean, uh, decolonial theory in Martinique and elsewhere was deeply infused uh, by surrealist ideas. And uh, if I had more time, I could, you know, tell you stories of surrealist lectures actually setting off uprisings. Um, uh, so if you're interested in those sorts of things, there's a wonderful book called uh, 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 Refusal of the Shadow. Uh, surrealism in the Caribbean, and another good book is Black, Brown, and Beige. Um, that's about the surrealisms of the African diaspora. Um, so, so Suzanne Cesar said, quote, the most urgent task was to liberate the mind from the shackles of absurd logic and so-called reason, unquote. Um, and so these folks were about Praxis. These folks were about how do we do what I was just saying we need to, how do we uh, access the surreal, the more than real, the more than logical, the other than conscious self. Hmm? Um, and they used tactics such as um, automatic writing, um, uh, collective drawing, um, and more. And as I said, in some instances, um, succeeded quite well at um, not just leading people to feel more free within themselves, but energizing people to do things that made a real difference um, in, um, in, 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 in the political realm. Um, I'm feeling uh, disoriented again by this spin through history, um, uh, which I have to do so quickly so that I can say the other things. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm just going to tell you quickly about, um, I mentioned um, more recent uh, Afrofuturism when I was mentioning um, uh, 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 P-Funk. Um, and, and you know, there's some wonder, extraordinarily important work right now being done uh, uh, by folks who think of themselves some uh, as Afrofuturists. Uh, AFCO has said some really interesting things about um, how Afrofuturism troubles the human. Um, uh, 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 many Afrofuturists are about um, troubling the category of human, and I know uh, earlier in, in this um, conference people were talking about sort of expanding the human to include animals, and then others have talked about like demolishing the category of animal, but really, um, you know, there's another way to think about this um, uh, uh, within both um, uh, Afrofuturism and Afropessimism, which is about demolishing the human um, as a category. Um, uh, but we're not going to talk theories right now. Um, I'm, instead, I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, someone who many people consider the original Afrofuturist Sun Ra, uh, who was a um, uh, uh, jazz uh, composer, band leader, musician, and thinker. Um, born in 1914, started recording in the 1940s, and, and continued recording into the 1980s. Um, he was a vegetarian. And he repeatedly said, in all seriousness, um, that he was not human. And what he wanted to do with his music, he said, a Sun Ra is another person who sometimes doesn't get taken seriously. And, and in part, it's because of the disregard for the arts and music in particular, not being word-based, um, but also because uh, he was, um, uh, his, his ways of thinking would be written off as, as perhaps uh, 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 some people would, would think uh, psychotic or um, uh, neuroatypical, you, you might say. Um, uh, uh, but, but he was quite serious um, in what he was saying and, and what he was doing. Um, uh, so he insisted that he was not human, nor was he interested in being human. And, um, and that what he was trying to do with his music 
was make it possible for people to feel emotions that never existed before. To feel things they had not, new emotions. Be, have new thoughts. I think what he was about was this, this trying to think differently, think beyond the, the strictures of, 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 of rationalism. Um, and I will just say, of course, this is one of these things where we can't, we can't know did he succeed or not. He liked to imagine that you know, someone would, would hear his band playing in the park and then like 10 years later would say, whoa, that song I heard in the park, like that changed my life. Um, but I didn't realize it at the time. Um, I can say that when I need to think differently, um, I will uh, listen to Sun Ra. I actually have a playlist of Sun Ra tunes approved by Harvey and Wiley. Um, and it does help me. Um, one of the things that Sun Ra did was play jazz standards. Um, I, for those of you who listen, uh, who don't listen to jazz, so there are you know some tunes that are uh, played uh, by almost everybody, right? Um, oh, oh gosh, I saw that big willow by the river Risa. so uh, willow wheat for me is one of them um, and uh, he would play jazz standards but then he would he would he would he would he would just tweak them and you'd be listening and then suddenly there would be this change in what you expected I'm not sure if I can it's not words um, uh, and I think that what he was doing what the uh, Situationist International would later call détournement, uh, uh, détournement, uh, which is, uh, I guess, de detouring would be a closest, um, uh, which is to take uh, existing cultural uh, phenomena and detour them in a way that will provoke people to see things differently, think differently, feel differently, yeah? Um, so that leads us to the Situationists, uh, 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 who were uh, uh, formally active from 1957 through 1972, um, and were an aggregation of um, anti-capitalist, anarchistic artists, theorists. Um, they played a huge role in the 1968 Paris uprisings. Um, and before I say a little more about them themselves, so now I'm going to do like, I'm going to detourn the situationists. So anyway, this is my riff on situationists um, because uh, I think it's really important uh, to think about the problems that we are trying to solve as situations. Wait, okay, oh my gosh. Oh, I, oh, okay. Okay, so the problems that we're trying to solve as situations, complex confluences of time, space, material, things that are happening, social systems, economic systems, etc. And so there's situations in which you need, we need to make interventions, right? That's the ecological way of solving problems. So for example, if we're thinking about bullfighting, which we heard about yesterday, um, we can see bullfighting in Colombia as um, a situation um, that's located in a very specific space space and that includes um, uh, 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 so many different uh, social threads such as ideas about masculinity, uh, such as ideas about masculinity imported from Spain um, and so we've got colonialism in there, yes, and then, there, and then there's, uh, we were hearing about the money involved in the folks who own the bull rings uh, uh, and so if we want to intervene in that situation we're going to need to be aware of these different factors, right, and try to intervene in the, in the situation. Um, and we actually saw a beautifully uh, uh, situationist um, uh, example of detournement uh, yesterday uh, in the speech about um, the, the uh, activism in Colombia uh, when, the, when the people put the um, placards or t-shirts on the, um, the statues of, of, of all of the famous people from uh, Colombian history all then suddenly one morning appeared to be um, wearing placards um, announcing their opposition to bullfighting. 
Um, and so we would suppose that people would then be surprised um, uh, uh, and, and, and think. So, um, so surprise is a big element in what situationists thought we needed to do. They thought that in order to provoke that sort of mind open uh, state that I was talking about earlier, um, an element of surprise, right? People come around the corner and they see something they didn't expect to see or an idea they didn't expect to see or they see something familiar that's been tweaked in a way that makes it unfamiliar um, and then leads them to start um, thinking differently, seeing differently, feeling differently. Um, but they also critiqued the spectacle um, and warned of a tendency for all of our authentic behaviors uh, to be turned into spectacles, which I think has happened a lot uh, with protests, hmm? uh, or people are more interested in marching down the street. Um, and being seen. Um, so, a one situationist slogan was, our ideas are on everyone's minds. The idea being that the discontent with the current state of affairs was there, latent in people, um, and it was merely a matter of sort of surprising them into becoming aware of that dissatisfaction and then providing them with tools to enact that dissatisfaction, yes? And another slogan, I just am saying this is my favorite as we segue, um, is uh, beneath the paving stones, the beach. Um, so, Plumwood, um, uh, had uh, five uh, things uh, that were, uh, she called the um, sort of elements of centrist logic, and she had some ideas for how to undermine them. So I'm going to really quickly read them off, and what I want you to do while I'm doing that is imagine how, rather than sort of didactic activism or just thinking and writing about things, what would be some bloomingly um, colorful, non-word ways that we might do these things she thought we needed to do? Huh? Okay, so to counter, so the, the things are radical exclusion, homogenization and stereotyping, denial of human dependency, incorporation, instrumentalism. So in order to counter the radical exclusion, meaning you know that animals are radically excluded from the category of human, Plumwood called for, quote, emphasizing human continuity with the other than human world in order to, quote, challenge or disrupt human conceptions of identity. Um, I would just argue that I would hope we would do that instead of, uh, it's very frequent, it's very common among animal advocates to sort of show the ways that they are like us. I would really like us to emphasize human continuity by showing the ways that we are like them, huh? Uh, thereby decentering ourselves while doing that. Um, uh, next, noting that terms like nature, quote, lump seals and elephants along with mountains and clouds, unquote, Plumwood suggested emphasizing, quote, nature's amazing diversity uh, to counteract homogenization and stereotyping. And so here we're in the realm, right, of marvelous animals um, and also in the realm of uh, surprise, I hope. Um, uh, next, in order to counter the denial of human uh, dependency that allows us to see all of the rest of the world as background to our heroic endeavors, Plumwood felt it would be necessary to, quote, puncture the illusion of disembeddedness. I think there's so much that we could do here and so much that climate activists are trying to do here, but here is where we need to be a little bit worried about the, what I would think of as the Dada error of just sort of saying, we're fucked, we're fucked, we're fucked, um, in a way that leaves people um, paralyzed or running for comfort um, uh, rather than reaching um, for um, and being able to imagine the other world. Hmm? Um, in order to challenge incorporation, which is a uh, a key element of which is the definition of the other by way of reference to the allegedly both normal and superior one, Plumwood felt it would be necessary to, quote, displace the deeply rooted view of non-human difference as lack. Um, and so there's so many things we could do, huh? To uh, 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 simultaneously demonstrate the um, limits of our uh, rational thinking while calling attention to um, the marvelous other ways that other beings are able to think and communicate, right? Like the waggle dances of bumblebees. Do you know about those? Look them up. They, 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 yeah, they dance directions. Whew, to pollen. Um, flowers. Okay, and uh, to counter instrumentalism, Plumwood called for more attention to nature's own creativity and agency. And so, um, again, um, I think there are many ways we could do that. Folks, uh, 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 
I, I, I'm noting how, how amazed people are by what's been called the worldwide wood, right? The, um, the fungi who are, uh, who are collaborating with the trees to communicate across long distances and oh, how surprised everyone is by that, but okay. Let's, um, let's, let's build on that surprise. Okay. I'm coming to the conclusion if I can find it. Okay, seriously. There's one piece of paper that looks different than all the others, and here it is. There we go, okay. So let's go back to Harvey. Um, Harvey, um, uh, used, uh, was, uh, why is he at a farmed animal sanctuary? Because if you run an animal sanctuary in a rural region, all sorts of animals who aren't technically within your remit um, end up uh, living with you. Um, Harvey had been kept alone in a cage, um, a barren uh, cage for mm, at least 10 years, more probably, um, until uh, the person um, died. Um, and then the local... Humane society didn't know what to do with him, and he was really very, um, uh, not just depressed, but um, you know, his development had really been stunted by the, 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 the lack of anything, huh? Um, and it's been beautiful um, now that he's with Wiley, who's extraordinarily verbal and verbose and mocks me constantly, um, um, but also um, calms me. I was wishing she was here. She likes to say, you're okay. <laughs> in my voice. You're okay. Um, <laughs> um, but Harvey, y'all were just laughing. Okay, so if Harvey was here, he would be laughing with you. Harvey laughs when you laugh. Um, he, and he laughs his full, he laughs, and then of course, because he's laughing, you start laughing more, right? Which then makes him laugh more, and then you laugh more. And sometimes you're just laughing so hard you are falling down. Um, but here's the most amazing thing about Harvey is that mm, he also, um, if you, so it's not just that he's imitating, I want you to, he's not just imitating the sound of laughing, right? He gets it. And how I know this, how I know he's got a great sense of humor is because if, uh, like, two people are in the parrot room and they're talking and, like, and, and then you start to say something, you know, that's going to be a little bit funny, um, he will um, start to, um, he will give off an anticipatory chuckle. <laughs> and, and, and he will chuckle, and then when the other person laughs, then he'll laugh, right? Um, and really, this is just, um, to me, extraordinary. I mean, uh, obviously, it's an extraordinary feat of cognition uh, to know some other animal well enough uh, to recognize that they're about to tell a joke. <laughs> right? And then the anticipatory chuckle, he wants you to tell the joke. Um, he's hoping for the joke. This animal who had has had done to him, you know, one of the worst things that people can do to an animal, keep a bird alone in a barren cage, and still, you know, he's hoping you're going to tell a joke. Um, and that just reminds me of, uh, you know, those ducks, the self-possessed duck, boy, they talk smack about you. Um, <laughs> If you're like slow, and so you know, it's they, you know, when they're talking smack about me, they're hoping, you know, that I will get it together and de-ice that water bowl. Um, um, so, so, but what I'm saying here is, you know, the fishes we learned, you know, the, the, the animals have been looking at us longer than we have been looking at them, and you know, some of them are hoping, you know, they know very well, right? They know very well the dangerousness of uh, us. I do not think that they share our opinion of ourselves as the smartest ones um, at all. They know we're the dangerous ones, but I think some, at least some of them know that we're capable of other things, huh? And they're hoping for that joke. Jokes are a big part of surrealism too, by the way. So I want to thank everybody, I, I want to thank everyone again for, for bringing me, and I thank all of you for having patience with me. Um, um, it's meant so much to me to be here and to have the 
opportunity to be in this place where I've seen so much surrealist art as I've been wandering uh, through the city, which I encourage you to do too, if you've not yet. And I've uh, loved the idea of ability to be walking alongside the river and see ducks here. And along one of those walks, I, 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 I happened upon the um, entirely spontaneous um, memorial uh, to the victims of the mosques shooting, uh, which is by the um, botanical garden. And there you see um, not just um, the predictable flowers, uh, but so many um, pieces of art, handmade, often quite clumsy art, which was I think, you know, people reaching because they didn't have words, right? And so they were reaching for a way to say something about pain and mourning, but also uh, we're with you, the communion, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and this is what, that, that, that's the impulse. That's the impulse we need to work with because I think people have that impulse when it comes to non-human animals too. I think people are deeply lonely um, due to our estrangement from non-human animals. I think people are deeply disturbed by what's happening with the weather. And I think that people are deeply saddened by things like extinction. And I think that people are, I think it's true that our ideas are on everyone's mind. We just have to find a way um, to call to that impulse. And I think that if we bring all of ourselves, including our more than conscious selves, uh, to bear, um, uh, then, then we can, in fact, um, support that striving for communion. Thank you so much.